Hello and welcome to the CBC Butterfly Blitz training session. My name is Laura Timms and I'll be your speaker for this session. I am going to give you a little bit of background on the Butterfly Blitz and then I'm going to get into the training portion which is about how to find butterflies. And throughout the presentation you'll notice that my camera turns on and off and that's so that I don't block the pictures on the slides. Okay, let's get started. So why is CVC running a Butterfly Blitz Citizen Science Program? Well, CVC has had a citizen science program for a number of years, and we ran a project called Check Your Watershed Day, where residents were asked to go out to their local waterways and take some measurements and report back. After doing that for a number of years, we wanted to do something different and decided to focus on an insect citizen science program. And this is because of the global issue of insect declines and pollinator declines um, as one group of insects that are, that are decreasing all over the world, including in Canada. And focusing in from insects and pollinators as a whole, we wanted to do a butterfly-based program for a few different reasons, which is that butterflies um, are a pretty easy group to learn how to identify and how to find, and part of that is what we're training you on today. Also, there's an established community of people in Ontario who love going out to look for butterflies and talking about butterflies and sharing their knowledge and information about butterflies. And so that's helpful when you're trying to introduce new people to a subject. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, butterflies are a really beautiful and interesting group of organisms that people just love going out to find and look at. So we hope that you will too this summer. This is the fourth year of our Butterfly Blitz. We started all the way back in 2019. And if this is the first year you're joining us, welcome. And if you've been a participant before in the past, thanks for coming back. Butterfly Blitz is a summer long project, so you can participate starting now in May all the way through to September. And there are a number of different ways that you can participate. So you can make observations of butterflies and submit them to iNaturalist. You can conduct timed surveys and submit them to eButterfly. You can join us in some of our CVC-led in-person outings, including the one-day butterfly count in June, which we will submit to the North American Butterfly Association. As you make those observations, you might find that some of them get featured as observations of the week on iNaturalist in the project. And you can also choose to enter some of our contests. Last year, we held coloring contest for the kids and photo contest for adults, and you might want to participate in those again this year. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to find butterflies so you can make those observations, but we're also running training sessions on eButterfly and using iNaturalist, um, and so if you want to learn about those, be sure to check out our other training sessions. At the end of the summer, at the end of the project in September, we will have a wrap-up event, and we hope that we will be able to do this in person. And at this event, we celebrate all of the wonderful butterfly observations and learning that happened all summer long, and we also hand out prizes. And so you could win a prize for making the most observations, for observing the most species, for finding the rarest species, for taking the best picture, for being the most involved, so participating in, in the most number of ways, and also we we feature a lucky day prize where we choose one day at random and then select someone who made a butterfly observation on that day. And this event can be a lot of fun, so we hope you will you, you'll be able to join us for it. People often ask what the data being collected by the Butterfly Blitz will be used for. And there are a number of different things that we want this data for. And the Butterfly Blitz project is not just for fun, it's collecting high quality data that will be used for a number of different purposes. So first off, it's helping us understand where species are found in the watershed. So for example, in this map of the eyed brown, we're starting to get a sense of where this relatively rare butterfly can be found throughout the Credit River watershed. It's also helping us understand for a particular area which species are found there, so the richness of species. So this is a picture of the forks of the Credit Provincial Park, and so far about 39 butterfly species have been found there, which is a pretty good number. Once we finish the project and we've collected all this data for five years, we're going to assess the local conservation status of butterflies in the watershed, so identifying which species are locally rare. Um, and this, this might be different than which species are locally rare in the province. There might be some species which are really rare here, but are common elsewhere. And that, that will be important because that'll allow us to then protect the habitats of those species. 
Beyond those uses within CBC, the data is getting added to iNaturalist and the Ontario Butterfly Atlas, and this will permit all kinds of other people to use the data and conduct various studies. For example, studies on long-term trends in populations and things like that. And you should know that Butterfly Blitz has really had an impact in the number of butterfly observations that are being seen in the watershed. So in 2018, before the Butterfly Blitz, throughout the whole summer um, on iNaturalist, there were only 174 observations of 40 species. But then you see since the Butterfly Blitz in 2019, 2020, and last year in 2021, we've seen a massive increase in both the number of individual butterflies that are being seen, so last year over 2,000, and also the number of species, so 65 species both in 2021 and 2020. And this is wonderful. It means we're really having an impact. The people participating are going out there and making observations and finding species and, and adding to all of that data that we're looking for. So we've found records of new species that we hadn't had in the watershed before, increased understanding of where those species are distributed, and also just a, a real increase in the coverage of butterfly data in the watershed. Okay, so now we're going to get into the training portion of this webinar, I'm talking about how to find butterflies. So in this training session, we're going to talk a little bit about butterfly behavior, which you need to know something about to be able to find butterflies. So understanding um, the things they do, which is largely feeding, reproducing, and resting. We'll talk about some of the habitats that are best for finding butterflies, when to look for them, briefly touch on some considerations about looking for butterflies during the COVID-19 pandemic, and at the end, a quick recap um, to cover all of the, the major points. Before I get into that, a little bit about me. So um, I'm an ecologist at CVC, and I've been here since 2013. And since 2019, I've been the technical coordinator of the Butterfly Blitz. So I handle the science side of the project, and I work with my colleague Lindsay Jennings in Outreach, who works with the outreach side. So if you watch some of our other webinars on using iNaturalist, then you'll see Lindsay in speaking in those. My background is in entomology, which is the study of insects, and also in forest conservation, ecology, and zoology. And I love bugs, and I'm really excited that we are focusing on this insect-based citizen science project to bring the love of bugs to all kinds of other people as well. So as I mentioned, it helps to know something about butterfly biology and behavior when you're out looking for butterflies. So understanding the kinds of things they do and where they hang out. And butterflies, like many animals, are mainly concerned with feeding, reproducing, and resting. And as we're looking at these lovely pictures on this slide, I'd just like to point out that these photos are all from Butterfly Blitz participants in previous years. And a big thank you to them for allowing us to use those pictures. Okay, first, talking about feeding. So butterflies, for the most part, eat nectar, and they have a long tongue called a proboscis that is usually curled up by their head unless they're feeding. So uh, when they are feeding, they'll stop on flowers and they'll uncurl that tongue to drink the nectar out of the flowers. And you'll find that some flowers are more attractive than other flowers. So flowers that have multiple flower heads means a butterfly doesn't have to hop around from one flower to the next, they can just shift around a little bit on that same plant. So for example, um, this uh, a thistle or a milkweed plant is a great flower to observe butterflies on. And butterflies, when they're drinking nectar, are not as choosy about the flowers that they feed on as their caterpillars are about what plants they eat. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, many butterflies are very specific in terms of the, the leaves that they eat, but not so specific about the, the plants that they feed from for their nectar. Butterflies don't just eat nectar though. Um, butterflies also need to drink water and many species can often be seen drinking from puddles with a behavior called puddling. And this is to get water, but also salts from the soil. And so often along a path or a muddy area on a beach, you'll find some butterflies stopping and drinking. Um, some butterflies also feed on tree sap, decaying fruit, carrion, so dead animals, or dung. And this is especially true of species that live in habitats that don't have a lot of flowers, so uh, species that are found more often in forests. So here we have a lovely photo of a black swallowtail eating some goose poo on a beach in Acton. So um, while butterflies are feeding, it's a great time to catch them because they're sort of in the middle of what they're doing and they're less likely to sort of quickly fly away and get away from you before you can catch a picture. 
After feeding, we have mating and butterflies are obviously really concerned with mating so that they can lay eggs and, and start the next generation. And males of many butterfly species, while they're looking for mates, will guard a territory. So they'll find a nice spot like a leaf that's high up that they can sort of scan the area and they will challenge anything that comes into the general airspace around that spot around that spot so they'll sort of fly up often a little spinny dance up into the air and then they'll come back down often resting in exactly the same spot so if you happen to see a butterfly fly up and you notice it just sort of pause and be still for a moment and maybe it might come back to that same spot or a spot pretty nearby i've seen these i've seen butterflies actually challenge um, birds and other things that come into their space. So they can be really fearless in terms of challenging things that, that fly into their areas. Butterflies, uh, in fact, lots of insects, especially males, will also fly around high areas in, in the particular location that they're in. And this is called hilltopping um, in insects. And it doesn't have to be literally the top of a hill though. It's generally just the highest point in an area. Um, this can often be sort of like if there's a little bank, um, it's sort of the side of a hill in, near a field or something like that. And this is because it provides a gathering place for insects to look for mates and find each other. So if you're in a meadow and there's kind of a small little rise, check out that area and you might be able to find butterflies there. After butterflies have mated, the females need to find plants to lay their eggs on. And as I mentioned before, many species of butterflies are very specific about the plants that they eat, and they might eat only one or a handful of different plant types. Like we all know monarchs eat milkweed plants. So you can find out which plants are preferred for different butterfly species by looking in a field guide, either a hard copy or an online guide. And then if you're trying to add that particular species to your list for the summer, say, um, see if you can figure out where those plants are growing and then you may be able to find that species of butterfly in that area where the plants are. Butterflies also spend a lot of time at rest. And one thing they do is basking. And this is because butterflies are cold-blooded, so they need the sun to warm them up and provide thermal energy to give them energy to fly around and do all those other behaviors. So especially on cooler days or in early mornings before it's warm, butterflies will sort of sit in a nice sunny spot and open their wings and just absorb that heat, uh, which sounds very nice to be honest. And some favorite basking spots could be um, on paths, on dirt roads, on warm rocks, or on the leaves of plants, like this least skipper is doing in this beautiful photo. Okay, that was behaviors. Now let's talk about habitats. So butterflies can really be found just about anywhere, um, as long as there's at least a few flowering plants. But some types of habitats support way more butterflies than others. So in general, habitats that have lots of native plant species with flowers will support the most butterflies. But um, to be honest, you can usually find at least one or two species of butterflies, even in sort of the most degraded urban natural area. Um, there'll usually be a cabbage white around at least, but also a few other species. Open habitats, so example, old fields, wet meadows, prairies are especially great for butterflies when they have flowering plants. But there are some species that you will only find inside woodlands or in specialized wetland habitats, say. So if you're walking through a forest, there might be a little clearing and you might find a butterfly there. So don't just focus on a meadow for butterflies, look in all kinds of different habitats. And if you want to find a bunch of different species, try to visit a site that has a diversity of habitat types. So maybe it has some forest, some wetland, some meadow. And uh, a really great place to look is on the edge, so transitional areas between different habitat types. So for example, in this picture, we've got a forest edge coming up to a wet meadow, and that is a great place to find butterflies. Um, I find that they often fly along the edges of those habitats as well. So if you yourself walk along those edges, that's a great place to look. Butterflies are most active in the middle of the day when it's the warmest. So I've said here generally about 1030 in the morning to three in the afternoon, but obviously that varies. Maybe um, in the summer when it's really warm, they'd be active a little bit earlier than that. And butterflies do tend to get 
faster and more active the warmer it is out. So if you're going to look for butterflies and it is a really warm day in the midsummer, it might be easier to see some of the species earlier in the day when they're just starting to warm up and not fluttering around quite so quickly. Butterflies are not active when it's raining or very windy. So conveniently, you might yourself not want to go out looking for butterflies on those days. And um, it's not, maybe not the best day to do it anyways, because you wouldn't have much success. So look for them on calm, sunny days. You can look for butterflies all season long, but it's important to remember that adult butterflies only live for a short while. So most of them would only be living for a few weeks, maybe even a few days. And there are different species around at the start of the summer than at the end. So uh, at the start of the summer, you might see silvery blue butterflies. Um, you might see them again later in the summer because there's actually a couple of generations of them. And then at the end of the summer, you might be seeing more species like this clouded sulfur and other sulfur species. And so we encourage you to keep going out and making butterfly observations to keep doing the butterfly blitz from May throughout September. And you'll notice a turnover in the species that you see throughout the year. So we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we do encourage you to remember to follow local public health recommendations about physical distancing when you're making your observations um, and to visit only natural areas that are open. And this maybe doesn't even have so much to do with COVID-19 these days, but in the Credit River watershed, there are some of our conservation areas that are closed for other reasons, for construction, um, but follow updates if you're looking to visit one of our properties. Um, in some cases, there may be reservations required. So just check out our website before you go, plan ahead. And to note also here is a map that you can also see on iNaturalist on the project page. This is a map of the Credit River watershed and we accept observations from anywhere within the watershed. So you can make a butterfly observation anywhere within those boundaries and it will be considered to be part of the project. In general, um, you can make a butterfly observation from anywhere in that boundary. So it could be in your backyard, it could be on the side of the road, it could be a public park, it could be a conservation area. Please make sure that the places you're looking for butterflies are publicly accessible or on your own property. So just be sure you know where you're walking and that you're not accidentally trespassing. I've included this map here, and this is something that uh, is provided to you with your registration package and on the website, but it highlights specific areas in the watershed where we still don't have a lot of butterfly data. So we've come a long way since 2019 in terms of getting observations in, uh, in more grid squares in the watershed. Um, but there are these places that are highlighted with those blue squares that we would like to get more observations. And so on this map, uh, you probably can't read it on the slide, but you can read it on the map that we'll provide to you. We've suggested a few natural areas in those grid squares that we would love you to visit and make butterfly observations so we can get our species numbers up in those areas. So to recap, you can find butterflies near flowers when they're feeding or mud puddles when they're feeding near the plants they want to lay eggs on once they've mated, on hilltops or guarding particular plants or areas when they're searching for mates, and on sunny patches when they're basking, especially on rocks, trails, dirt roads, and plants. In terms of habitats, you should look for butterflies in natural areas where there are a, are a diversity of native plants and different habitat types, and especially in open areas. Um, things like meadows, wet meadows, wetlands, etc. Areas of transition between different habitat types are a wonderful place to look and especially go out and look in the warmest parts of the day. So maybe around 1030 to 3. And don't forget to look all summer long because different butterfly species will be around in May than are around in September. You can look for butterflies in your own backyard. And if you don't have a lot of flowering plants or native plants in your backyard, now might be a good time to add more native plants. And I'll share some information shortly that will maybe help you do that. You can also look in conservation areas, in parks, and other places that are currently open and publicly accessible. And a reminder of those zones where we need more data and that that map is available on our website. And I'll explain to you how to find that uh, at the end of this presentation. So if you are interested in getting some free native pollinator plants for your garden, one of our longtime Butterfly Blitz participants, Julie Power, 
yeah, is a resident of Georgetown, and she has an amazing native plant garden, which is actually where she makes all of her butterfly observations. This is a photo of her garden. And Julie has also started an initiative to grow and share native plants for free with people who are interested in adding them to their gardens. So here is a partial list of all of the plants Julie can share with you, and she has very generously offered for Butterfly Blitz participants that you can reach out to her and obtain some of these plants. So if you're on iNaturalist, you can contact Julie through iNaturalist. Her username is Sunrise Gardener, and you can send her a message there. You could also join this Facebook group if you're on Facebook. The group is called Let's Nurture Nature, Halton Hills. Julie says anyone can join. You don't have to live in Halton Hills. And um, it's somewhat easier for her to manage requests for plants via this group because there's a form that you can fill out there with the plants that are available and your request for how many you would like. Now, if you're not on Facebook and you don't know how to use the messaging app on iNaturalist, please get in touch with me and I can connect you with Julie via email. So thanks very much, Julie, for that offer to share those plants. It's really wonderful. All right, so if we were together um, for an in-person training session or even a live webinar, then this is where you could ask your questions. But because this is pre-recorded, what I've done is pull together questions that we've received frequently in the past and added some answers to them. So one question that we often get is, should I add an observation for a species that I've already observed in that location? And is there any point to reporting common species? And these are kind of related questions. So I would say, yes, there is a point to reporting common species, and there is a point to reporting a species from a place that you've already seen it. So say there's a park that you like to go walking in, and every day you go out there and you see um, a, a pex skipper butterfly, for instance, and you observe it on Tuesday, should you also observe it on Thursday? And I would say definitely yes, because um, you never know what people are going to use iNaturalist or other citizen science data for, and someone might be interested in say um, wing variation so variation in color patterns on wings and uh, the more photos they have of different individual butterflies the more information they have it also might add information on how long a particular butterfly butterfly species is flying in a particular area or even things like interactions with um, nectar plants or other species so yes, I would definitely encourage you to make as many observations of the same species as you like, even if they are common species, like say the cabbage white butterfly. The next question, which is, should I observe caterpillars or butterflies that I have raised? And this is an interesting question. So iNaturalist is intended for observations of organisms in the wild in their natural habitat. So you could go to the zoo and take photos of all the animals you see there, but obviously uh, in Toronto, you're observing a giraffe that is not an organism in its natural habitat in the wild. So iNaturalist has a way of dealing with these observations, and I've highlighted here both in the desktop version and the um, mobile version for a phone, where you would click on an observation that, that that individual is captive or cultivated, so it's not in the wild in its natural habitat. Now, if you have found a caterpillar in the wild and you have raised it, say you brought it in your house and you put it in a jar or you've covered it with netting, it's not entirely captive or cultivated except because it's still in its natural habitat, you found it in the wild. So there is some debate there about whether it would be captive or cultivated. So you might want to indicate in the notes that it is a butterfly from the wild that you raised. Now, the question of should you be doing that or not is a whole other can of worms and uh, probably too much to get into in this presentation. So if you have questions about that, I would encourage you to email me and I put my email address at the end so you can get in touch. What I will say is that I don't think you should be purchasing butterflies um, and raising them. And there are all kinds of reasons why that is not a great thing to do. You can spread disease, you can uh, mess up the population genetics because you might be bringing in genes from different areas. Um, anyways, as I said, a whole other can of worms. Please get in touch if you have more questions about that. Okay, people often, when we present this training session, um, have questions about iNaturalist. Questions like, can I participate from outside the watershed? Why is my observation not showing up? How do I use iNaturalist? So I'll just take a moment here to plug that Lindsay, my colleague, has another training session on using iNaturalist that I would encourage you to check out. And you might find that many of your questions are answered there. Briefly here, I will say that um, 
the way the iNaturalist project is set up is that observations only count in the project if they're from within the watershed boundaries. So if you are making an observation of butterfly from outside the watershed boundaries, then it will not show up in the project. Now, that doesn't mean that you yourself can't live outside the watershed and come into the watershed and look for butterflies. And that's wonderful. We encourage you to do that. If you've made an observation that your positive is in the watershed, but it's not showing up in the project for some reason, there could be a few different reasons why that would happen. So again, please get in touch and we can figure it out together. It's probably something to do with your privacy settings or an obscuring of the location or things like that. But um, we can usually figure out those issues together. Okay, I mentioned those maps that show you the zones where we would like more butterfly data. We also have other resources and you can find them at our website. And here's the link and I'll show you what that looks like. So if you go to that link, you'll go to our website. It looks like this and you'll see over on the right hand side, it says review key information. And I put a pink box where it says downloads and resources. So if you click on that link, You'll get to this list, which includes a number of different resources, including a species checklist, the timed survey data sheet, and also the grid squares for butterfly observations. So if you click on that, then you will get a PDF version of that map that you can use to figure out where you want to go to look for butterflies. So I covered a few of the frequently asked questions, but if you have other questions that I didn't go over or address today, then please get in touch. Here is my email address and feel free to reach out about any question you have about the Butterfly Blitz. Thanks very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy your summer butterfly blitzing. Thanks. Bye-bye.